<laughs> I've never had theme music before. That's pretty cool. That's <laughs> all right. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Hey, hey. Uh, why don't you guys go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter eight. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of stuff to share of my own wisdom. If we're going to talk about freedom, if we're going to talk about what it means to be set free, I mean, we've got to start here. We've got to start in God's Word. And as, as Ted opened up, the, the way we're going to find freedom is through Jesus Christ and through His Word. And so why don't you go ahead and grab a Bible and turn to John 8. We're going to be starting in, in verse 30 of John 8. And I remember playing high school in football. I know you look at me in this hulking frame you see before you, but uh, I didn't really play a lot. I, I played really just to get out of school. And I, and I, I remember thinking, man, this equipment, it's so uncomfortable. I, I'm sure it's useful on the field, but on the bench, it just totally chafes, and I don't like it. And, and you know what? Here's the thing. I always remember that the coach, my coach was way over the top all the time, so intense. He would do that kind of football thing, and I'm not really into the whole football culture. Maybe you guys are, and you get it, but like pounding on your shoulder pads and slapping the side of my helmet and he'd grab the face mask and pull it right in close, right? And do that whole, so we're going to go kill the team, right? you got to stay focused. And I just said a bunch of other stuff. I wasn't focused, so I don't remember any of it, right? And I remember thinking, hey, coach, like, do you know I'm just going over to sit on the bench, right? Like, you know I'm not going out onto the field. Like, you're way over the top on this. And the guys who were playing, the guys who got onto the field, they loved it. They responded to it. They loved the coach. They loved the intensity, and then there's a time and there's a place for intensity. And if you're in the game, if you're actually going out onto the field, you're not going to find it too over the top. But if you're not in the game, if you're not on the field, if you're on the bench, you might find, man, that's way too much intensity. Like it's a bit over the top. It's a little bit unnecessary. It's like a commander in the army and he, and he starts barking out commands and yelling out orders while he's shopping in the mall. It's, it's out of place, right? It doesn't fit. And why is he out of place? He's, he's out of place because his intensity isn't matched by what's going on around him. The, the intensity of your communication needs to match the intensity of the situation you find yourself in. But what if in high school, what, what if I actually cared about the football game? What if the, the commander was actually in a time of war and not in the mall? And, and you know, Jesus says a lot of things that seem very extreme, too intense. And when we read what Jesus says, we can come to that place where we go, Jesus, you're, you're kind of out of place with that intensity. And, and we say, man, you're a little over the top, too extreme, or, or maybe, or maybe, maybe just maybe, Jesus wasn't too intense. Maybe he saw things for the reality of how they were. Maybe it's you and me who are out of place. And maybe we're sitting on the bench when we should be on the field. Maybe we're, we're showing up in the, a war zone wearing our flip-flops, carrying our Timmy's double-double, and we're going, whoa, Jesus, like, seriously, like, calm down, dude. Like, what are you And Jesus is telling us, you're in a war, and you're living like it's peacetime. And, and here in John 8, Jesus spent a lot of time talking and teaching, and, and he's got a lot of people following him now. And people, really, what it says in verse 30, what's it say? And he was saying these things, many believed him. Verse 31, so Jesus said to the Jews who what? Who had believed in him. So here he's talking to a bunch of people that think, no, we're in the game. We're not on the bench. We're on the field. We're in. And you look what Jesus says. And look at verse 34. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. Jesus said, you're not free. You're in bondage, you're in slavery. And, and then to, to drive that intensity a little bit more, to, to really make his point, look at verse 44, what he says. And these people who say, we're in, we believe. Look at verse 44. You're of your father, the devil. So you guys are sons of Satan. Intense. A, a little bit over the top here. It seems out of place, and I think maybe Jesus' word sometimes seems out of place. Because why? Because we think we're okay, because we think we're doing pretty good, and we think we're, we're doing all right. We may not feel totally free. We may get that, you know what, I, I know that I'm not fully free. I, I know that I'm kind of in this jail cell, but it's not too bad. You know, I get three squares a day. I get to work out and lift weights. I mean, sure, it's kind of scary sometimes, but, and, and we get to put wallpaper up around the walls, and, and we plug the little Glade plug in into our jail cell. And we're like, this is not too bad. This is okay. But every once in a while, when life slows down, we begin to look around, and we, we're left alone with our own thoughts, and we, we see the reality of our situation, and we push past all these things that we've put up around us to, to make the jail cell look a little more comfortable. 
And we see that it's still a jail cell. You know, history is filled with men who have reached the pinnacle of success, who have, who have gotten everything the world says. If you get this, you'll have freedom. You'll be fulfilled, and yet they were still enslaved, still depressed, still thirsty for something more, still empty. And when your life is full of achievement, yet you don't have God, if all you have is achievement, your life is still enslaved. Your soul shrivels up and dies. Why? Because we were meant for so much more. And not all the achievement, not all the critical acclaim, not all the plaques on the wall with your name on them, not all the praise from people, not all the, the largest business, all the money, all the pleasures of sin, not even the best family or the best church, none of that. If that's all you have coming into your life and your heart, if that's all you have, you're not free. Our life needs, needs, needs more than that, needs more nourishment, needs to be set free more than just these things. And, and Jesus, knowing that, knowing our situation, he brings the right amount of intensity when he cries out, you're lost, you're enslaved, you're dead. You might be thinking, man, I want this fulfilled life. And I've lived long enough to see that, that I'm starving, that, I, that I'm lost, that, that if I just look for nourishment and all these things that you're talking about, that, that I know that I, I won't be set free. And, and you're telling me there is real life, there is freedom. And your ears perk up a bit and you're like, tell me what it is. What is this freedom that Jesus is talking about? And you may have looked in so many different places for freedom and, and you've attached your life to things. You think this will set me free and, and pretty soon you recognize, man, there is no freedom in that. And so quickly we end up in one of two places. One, we get to a, a, a place we think, well, I guess this is it. I guess this is what life has to offer. I guess this jail cell is as good as it's going to get. And then you hear this call for freedom. You, you hear this, this call saying that you can be set free. And you think, you know what? It's not for me. I've tried it and I've failed. Or, or what do you do? The other thing you find yourself maybe doing is you just grab another piece of decoration. You try to make it work. You try to make the jail cell look a little nicer. And, and you try to, to have that be your freedom. And you think, well, come on, Jesus, just calm down. This isn't too bad. So this weekend, I want us to think, what, what do we put our hope in for freedom, for fulfillment, for deliverance? What do we put our hope in for life? I mean, is it your work? Is it having a perfect family? Is it being accepted, being esteemed? Is, is it reaching certain standards? Is, is it some sort of religious activity? Is it a hobby? Is it an addiction? Where do you go for your freedom? My prayer is that even tonight we begin to see the truth. We begin to see the truth of our situation that, that without the freedom that Jesus is offering, that our life is dark and our life is hopeless, and that we're not free. My prayer too, though, is that we see the other truth, the other reality, the truth that there is freedom. That you don't have to live imprisoned any longer. That, that, that Jesus says in verse 36 here, look what he says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Totally free. There's true hope. There's, there's true freedom. And I want to ask you tonight, when, when life feels tough, when stress piles in, when, when things aren't going so great, when you begin to feel the weight of, of sin and shame and stress and difficulties, where do you begin to run for your freedom? Where do you find your security, your comfort? Because Jesus is saying the only way you'll ever find true freedom is when you give up on all those other places you think will bring freedom. You recognize that they can't deliver. They can't actually set you free because for something to actually bring freedom, it has to actually deliver that. It has to reach down to those places where you are enslaved. It has to provide an answer to the biggest, deepest, darkest needs in your heart. And if there's no answer for what's broken, what's lost, what's enslaved, then why do we trust in it? So the question again is, where is your freedom? In this text here, Jesus talking to these people, we, we see that freedom's not found in a thing. It's not found in a place. It's not found in a situation. True freedom is found in a person, and, and, and his name is Jesus. 
That's where freedom is found. There is freedom. There is deliverance. There is rescue. And Jesus was so concerned that those who are lost and enslaved get this. And, and so out of love, he says, wake up. You need to see that you're in a jail cell, that you're not free. But listen, there is freedom. And all through the Gospels, Jesus spends so much time telling so many stories to try to wake people up. And he tells stories about bridesmaids waiting for a wedding. He says they all look the same, but only half of them were actually ready, were free. He talks about two houses being built. And they, on, on the outside, they both look the same. But only one was built on the rock. Only one was truly free. My question is, which house are you? It's, it's as though Jesus is so concerned that we actually get it, that we actually get that there's hope, there's grace, there's new life. The question is, are you embracing this hope? Are you embracing Jesus Christ? Because there is freedom. There is freedom. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let's look at what Jesus says here. I think the first thing we're going to see that Jesus says in these verses, the first thing we're going to see is that Jesus provides total freedom. Jesus provides total freedom, complete freedom. I mean, these guys here that Jesus is talking to, they thought they were free, and they, and they had a lot of reasons why they thought they were free. So look at verse 31. It says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, they said, We're offspring of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. How, how is it you say you'll become free? Because what are you talking about this freedom thing? Jesus, we are free. You recognize that, first of all, when you're not free, you can be so blind to the fact that you're in prison. And, and Satan will work so hard to decorate that jail cell, you actually believe you're free. And we can be so easily satisfied in thinking this is it. This is the free life. This is the free indeed that Jesus is talking about. It. And we, we can give up this abundant life of freedom and we can give it up for these temporal trinkets and think that we're free. Almost like you've been, you've been given free tickets to go see the Super Bowl. And you're on your way to the Super Bowl and you've got this box seats where it's going to be full of food to see the game live. And on the way to the game, you're in the parking lot on your way to it and you trip over a half-eaten corn dog and you go, you know what? That corn dog looks all right. And I've, I can watch the game on my iPhone and I can just sit here in the parking lot and the corn dog's good. The iPhone, no, they're not. That's not what you're, you've been promised. We become so easily satisfied. We, 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 we settle spiritually for these things, these, these half-eaten corn dogs. We settle for this, this freedom that we think we have. We settle for just outward religion. We settle for our work. We settle for pornography or greed or, or comfort or ease or control or success. And we settle for it and stop pursuing what's excellent. Stop pursuing what we've been promised. And these guys here, they say, we don't need your freedom. We've got it. We're children of Abraham. I mean, I get it. Nobody here is going to say, Kyle, like, like, you can stop preaching now because I'm Jewish. I don't need what you have to say. I mean, that's what they're saying. And, and, and don't miss, though, what they're really saying. What they're saying are things like what we would say. Yeah, I don't need it. I come from a good Christian home. It's, it's okay. I go to harvest. It's okay, like my wife, like she's super spiritual, man. Like she carries it for the family, and so I'm okay. I don't need this freedom you're talking about. I mean, everybody in my family loves God. Listen, the reality is none of that makes any difference unless you personally know and abide in Christ. Unless you abide in his word, unless you are one of his disciples. They totally miss what Jesus said. He says, if you abide in my word, if you know who I am, and they're saying, thanks for the offer, Jesus, but we're good. We don't need your freedom because our, our tradition gives us freedom. In fact, look in verse 41. They answer him even more. Jesus says, you're doing the works of your father, didn't they? They said, wait a minute, we're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. What are they saying there? They're saying, hey, 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 we're not illegitimate children. We haven't mixed in other religions in here. Like, we're pure Jews, man. We got this going on. We've got it figured out. No idol worship. We're knocking out of the park. We're pretty fired up at this point, right? They're saying, listen, we're not bastard children, man. We are the real deal here. So this whole thing about you saying we need freedom, we don't. And Jesus says, you're not free. Your good life, 
your good works, your nice church. You're not free if you're not abiding in me. He says, you're not free if you don't know me, if you don't know my word. And I think we've been sold this lie, this lie that, no, we're actually doing pretty good. Like, deep down inside, like, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. And, and all I need to do is just let that real person out. Thank you, Disney, for that one, right? Like, you just, you just if my true self comes out, I mean, I'll show you that I really am free. It's a lie. And we think we're okay, and Jesus says, no, you're not okay. You don't just need a little cleaning up. You don't just need to improve yourself a little bit without abiding in Christ, without listening to his word, without being connected with him, without resting on his finished work on the cross, without calling him your Lord and Savior. We're dead in sin. We're enslaved. We're in prison. And Jesus says, if, if you're in sin, you're enslaved. He says in verse 34, this is what got them fired up. Jesus answered them and said, Truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. He's saying, hey, if, if you're living in sin, sin owns you. And sin's a, a horrible taskmaster. Sin will beat you down. Sin will be harsh and cruel and mean because sin wants to see you totally destroyed. And listen, he's not talking about individual acts of sins because these guys in John are going, we're doing good, Jesus. We follow the law really well. We're not like the real sinners. Jesus is saying, hey, no, I'm talking about something deeper than that. I'm talking about where sin originates, where, where it comes out of your heart, a heart of sin. He says, if that's where you are, you're a slave to sin. And you can sit here tonight and you could argue, man, I don't need this whole Jesus thing because I got it going on myself because I'm doing pretty good on my own. And Jesus says, no, you're not. Like, no, 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 I am pretty good. If I, if I sin, I say, oops, sorry, and I'm okay. And Jesus is saying, no, listen, without me, you shouldn't be saying, oops, I'm sorry that I sinned. You should be saying, oops, I'm sorry I did something right. Because who you are when you are in sin, when you are without Christ, the natural person of who you are is sin. So if, if that's where you find yourself, you should be saying, oops, I'm sorry I was honest. That's totally not me. Boy, I'm sorry I did something nice there because that's wacky that I would do something nice because my heart is full of sin. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying you need to be set free from this sin and the only way for this to happen is through him, is through his death. You know, it's kind of crazy what they say to him in verse 33. When they say we're offspring of Abraham, look what else they say. They say we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say we'll become free? So we've never been in slavery, Jesus. Well, other than the Babylonians, right? And the Assyrians and all that whole Egyptian thing that happened. I mean, you, you look back at Egypt, I'm telling you, that the, the, the greatest picture of this, this liberation and freedom is seen as the Israelites are released from Egypt. And they were enslaved in Egypt. They didn't just need a, an improvement to their situation. Or it wasn't like, you know, hey, Pharaoh, if you could just make this a little nicer, like if you could improve our retirement program, oh, and maybe lessen the beatings a little bit, then that's all we need. No, they needed to be set free. And so what did God do? God started this act of deliverance for, for the Israelites as they're, as they're trapped in Egypt. And it started before they got to that whole Red Sea thing. I mean, that was pretty cool. But God began it even before that with that final plague that happened in Egypt. And this plague of death, it gives this picture to the Israelites that God says, I'm going to come and redeem you and save you. He says, there's going to be an angel of death that's going to come. And it's going to go over every household in Egypt. And the firstborn of every household will die. And this last plague that God brings into Egypt, this, this final plague, it affects everyone. Even the, the Israelites aren't excused from this one. You, you read the story of all those plagues and, and the rest of the plagues, man, they only affected the Egyptians, the frogs, the flies. But here, this last one, everybody's involved. And this angel of death comes, even the Israelites were affected. And why is that? Why does everyone need to be affected by this angel of death? Because God's showing them something. He's showing us that everyone's a sinner in need of rescue. Not just that nasty Pharaoh guy, all of us. And so the picture we see in the Exodus in this final plague is that God's serious about sin. Deadly serious. 
He's a holy God, and we deserve destruction. And, and, and this holy God is also our only hope, and our only hope is that he delivers us from this punishment that's a just punishment. And, and the, the whole exodus then becomes, it's much more than just delivery from, from Egypt, much more than just delivery from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. But you're going to get the picture that this is a delivery from something bigger than that, a delivery and freedom from sin. Delivered from the greater Pharaoh, which is Satan and sin and ourself. But at the same time, we see this holiness of God, that he will not tolerate sin. We also see him as the deliverer, as the one who brings freedom, as the one who brings hope, as the loving Savior. In the story of the Exodus, it's, it's the amazing story of, of freedom in Jesus Christ. God makes a way for their salvation. He says, hey, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take this spotless lamb. And you're going to take the lamb and you're, you're, going, to, you're going to kill the lamb. And then you're going to take its blood and spread it on the doorpost. And, and now that lamb is going to die instead of you. That lamb is going to take the punishment, the wrath that's poured out for your sin. It's now going to be that lamb. When you spread the blood of that lamb over the doorpost, the angel of death will pass over you. It's that spotless lamb, that blood of the lamb. It's the only difference that night in the cries of sorrow from the Egyptian homes and the cries of excitement and freedom from the Israelites. We've got to catch this. It wasn't because the Israelites were better than the Egyptians. It's not because the Israelites have done something to, to gain the approval or the favor of God. The picture is this. God says, here's a substitute. Here's something. When the destroyer comes, a substitute for you where my wrath will be poured out on that. And you'll take this lamb, you'll kill it, you'll spread, spread the blood on the doorpost, and you're going to be delivered from death. I mean, God's a holy God. He's a just God. And because God is holy and just, he can't just look the other way at sin. It needs to be punished wherever it's found. And so what does he do? He, he pours out his wrath. There is payment on sin. And because these people believed in the sacrifice of this lamb that God had provided, then the penalty paid by this lamb gave them freedom. They were set free. I love it because here, when we get to the book of John we're in right now, we get to the book of John when Jesus first shows up on the scene. Do you remember what John the Baptist yells out when he sees him? John the Baptist calls out, behold the what? The Lamb of God. And, and if, you're a, if you're an Israelite, you, you, you would have caught that right away because you spent your whole life seeing lambs being slaughtered, being sacrificed for your sin. You would have spent, your, your people would have spent thousands of years celebrating the Passover again and again. And now here comes Jesus. And you hear John the Baptist saying, here's the Lamb of God. Here's the ultimate Lamb. Here's a Lamb that can answer for all, for, for our freedom, for our deliverance how we can be called pure and holy and, and how we can become friends of God because of this Lamb of God. Jesus, our hope has come. I love how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians where he says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us instead of us. So what? So that we can become the righteousness of God. I mean, no one else could take the full wrath of, of the Father upon himself. Nobody else. So God substitutes his son, fully God, fully man, pure and spotless. And on the cross, this Lamb of God sheds his blood, satisfies God's wrath, saves our souls. And this all happens. Why? Because of the blood of Christ. And so Jesus begins this whole section talking to these guys here. He says, if you abide in my word, verse 31. If you abide in my word, you're the real deal. You're born again. You've passed from darkness to light. You won't die in your sins. You're no longer children of the devil. You're now sons of God. Why? Because Jesus is the better sacrifice. As the book of Hebrews says that, that Jesus is a, a better lamb than all the lambs sacrificed year after year after year. He's the one who can take the full payment for our sin. So that everybody here in this room, no matter how dark your past is, no matter how sinful the choices you made have been, no matter how guilty your, your conscience is, no matter how much you, you've tried to rely on, on good works, no matter how you've tried to rely on, on religion, no matter how, how apathetic you've been as a man. You said, man, I've just been coasting. I've been going through the motions. You, all this stuff. Listen, if you're trusting in the blood of Christ over your life, you're saved in the presence of God. You're saved from the power of sin. 
Not because you're better, not because you've done more, not because you've checked off the right boxes. It's only through faith as you humbly put yourself on your face, broken before the cross. And that's the only difference that night of the Passover. It's the only difference in every single one of our lives here in this room. When one day you and I stand before a holy God to give an account for our lives, it's what determines even tonight, are you really free? The ultimate question is, have you trusted in the blood? Have you fallen on your face before the cross and said, I'm lost in my sin, I am dead, and I trust in your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. I want to give my whole life to following you. Now listen, don't miss this. Don't miss it. If you're sitting there going, that's a great gospel message, Kai. Like, that's great for anybody who's here who doesn't know Jesus. Listen, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, I mean, let's not live our Christian lives as though now our acceptance is based on what we do. How often we pray, how much you read the Bible, how much we're serving. You weren't just saved by grace. You're still right now, right now, daily saved by grace. I mean, don't miss this. Your acceptance right now, tonight, that this moment, it's still totally based on the blood of Christ over your life. Right now. That God's not looking at you going, man, you clean this stuff up. Like maybe tomorrow I'll call you righteous. Maybe tomorrow I'll set you free. He says, you're free right now. Whenever Satan comes and he, and he comes and he brings condemnation, that you can trust with confidence in the fact that you're under the blood of Christ. You're free from condemnation. I mean, that's solid biblical truth that there is total freedom. There is new life in Jesus Christ. But here comes a problem. The problem comes and maybe you're saying, you're thinking, yeah, I get that. I get the truth of my freedom. I get theologically, I get it. But what happens when I don't feel like this? Like, why, if, if I'm forgiven, if I have new life, if I've been set free, why do I still struggle with shame and with guilt and with hurt? Like, is there any hope for me? Is, is, is there really any freedom for me as a follower of Christ? Listen, Christ provides total freedom. And here's the second point for tonight, and it's this, that I can live a life of total freedom. I can live a life of total freedom. And you might be here tonight saying, I get it, I, I've been forgiven, I've been set free, and yet, yet the shame and this guilt, it's like it hunts me down and screams into my heart who I am. It tells me, you're this guilty person, you're this shame-filled person, you're this sin that you have. And you may, you may fully get the truth that you've been forgiven and you still carry this weight of sin and this weight of shame and guilt. And how do we deal with that? How do I deal with this guilt and shame? Because we know that all the Oprah-isms of you're a good person, you're a, you're a superstar, we know that doesn't work. And we know that working hard on some outward religious thing, it doesn't last. We know that, that just pursuing after sin and saying, I'm going to find freedom and relief by just going hard after this sin because it's, it's too tiring to go against it. We know that that doesn't provide any lasting freedom. In fact, it only enslaves us more. We know that hiding makes it worse. When we try to find freedom by removing ourselves from relationships, right? Like, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm not going to participate in my small group anymore. I'm, I'm going to become distant. I'm going I'm to become that distant husband who never opens up with his wife, never shares deeply. A distant friend, distant parent. And you never grow deep. You, ne- you never open up. You never talk about real things. But we know that none of that works. It doesn't provide freedom. It doesn't deal with the shame and the guilt and the hurt. And so, so if we need freedom that goes deeper than that, that delivers it goes deeper, deeper than, than just surface affirmations, deeper than just building our self-esteem, deeper than just religious check marks, deep enough to even reach us when we're hiding. It has to deal with the core of who we are. I still love the story of, of the Israelites being set free from Egypt because we know what happens, right? After, after the, the plague comes through and they're set free, they're on their way out, they've got their freedom. What's the first thing they run into? They run into the Red Sea. Like, well, I, I thought we were free, and now here we are about to die in the Red Sea, and, and they were scared to death. Why? Because the Egyptians were still hot on their heels now. Pharaoh was like, I just lost my whole workforce. I'm going to get them, and I'm bringing them back. 
And as Christians, we're, we're, we can be so like, hey, I, I've left, man. I've been delivered. I've come to Christ. I've prayed the prayer. I've done the Passover deal. Why is Egypt still after me? Why this sin and this shame and this temptation and this weight? I mean, do you feel that? Do you ever feel that where you think, man, I, I thought I was supposed to be free? If I can't win, if this isn't going to work, then I'm just going back to the temptation. I'm going to run full speed into it. And listen, that's what the, the Israelites said all through the wilderness. They kept going, man, we should just go back to Egypt. The Egyptians, they owned us. It must be who we are. I'm a slave of Egypt. I'm a slave of sin. I belong in Egypt. That was what Pharaoh was saying as he's chasing him down. He's saying, you're mine and I'm bringing you home. And, and Satan presses into our hearts and, and tries to tell us that you haven't been set free by the blood of Christ. He says, I own you. You're still mine. But listen, God steps in as the rescuer. and He says something different over your life. He says, no, no, I bought you with the blood of Christ. You're mine now. You're, you're my treasure Maybe even tonight you see yourself as a slave. You see yourself as this naked, naked, beaten down, dirty, abused, stained by sin that you've done, maybe stained by sin that's been done to you. And, and listen, God says to you, you're my treasured possession. The old is gone, the new has come. I mean, everything that had to do with Egypt, it's all passed away and the, the new has come once and for all, forever changed. This is your reality. If you're a follower of Christ, this is your story. I mean, Jesus says in verse 35 here of John 8, he says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So you, you, you're not slaves any longer when you come to Christ. You now become a son. And, and the picture of the, the Red Sea is this, this amazing picture that as Christians, we can look back and go, yeah, that's the reality of my life. The old has gone. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I've been set free from guilt. I've been set free from shame. I'm now considered a son of God. What happens at the Red Sea? Remember, that was that, this huge display of God's power where, where he steps in and, and, and he, he opens up the Red Sea and the, the Israelites, they walk across on dry land. This, this raging sea and I, could you imagine that? I mean, I'm just thinking how cool that would have been to walk through on dry land with a sea on either side of you. And the, this thing that you thought, this is gonna kill us, this sea is gonna, we're all gonna drown here. And God says, no, that's not gonna kill you. It's now part and it becomes your salvation. And what do you do to deserve it? You do nothing. God, God said to the Israelites, he said, just stand back, just be silent and I'll show you who's in charge. He says, you were a slave, but now you're free. You, you were in darkness, now you have light. This is your salvation. And let me tell you, that is, that's what makes Christianity so unique. You didn't build a bridge. It wasn't just the, the Israelites who, who really had faith, the ones who were totally confident. They weren't the only ones to cross through. I mean, the, the ones who were running through going, God is great, this is awesome. They get through, but so are the ones going, hurry quick, because it's all going to come in. Right? They all go through. They all walk through on dry land. God's showing, he's saying, listen, I'll fight for you. You just have to remain silent. I'm in control. I own the chaos. Pharaoh's no longer in control. I'm sovereign. I'm the one calling the shots. Your sin no longer calls the shots. Your circumstances don't call the shots. Not even you or me. God's saying, you thought you were dead, but by my power and by the blood of Christ, you're going to walk through dry ground to freedom. And then what happens to the enemy? What, what happens to the sin and the shame and this guilt? I love in Exodus 14, as they cross over the Red Sea, what happens? They turn around and look behind, and what happens to the Egyptians and to Pharaoh? The sea closes in on them. It says they turned around and saw them all dead. Not one remained. Defeated by the same sea that saved them. It says in Colossians 2.15 that, that Jesus Christ in his death put authorities to shame. The death of Christ that you entered in through. As you passed through with Christ in his death. That you joined him in death. You died to self. That same death killed, killed your past. Killed the shame. 
There's no condemnation for you. You're not owned by the sin anymore. It's all been dealt with on the cross. And I, I love that. I mean, you could be sitting here going, yeah, but you don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. I love how Paul says in Galatians, Galatians 1.13, when he says, you've heard of my former life. Paul, you, you mean the murdering? You mean the opposing God? You mean throwing whole families into jail? And he says, I've been set apart by the grace of God through his son. And think about it. If you were a Christian in the first century, you wanted God to take care of Paul. You're like, man, I could think of a couple plagues that would help us out here, God. Like if you take Paul out, and what did God do? God did take care of Paul. God introduced Paul to Jesus. Paul met Jesus Christ and he was transformed forever. He was completely changed. He went from this murdering Paul to the greatest missionary ever. He's been set free. And for you and me, we need to walk in that same freedom. The Bible calls it sanctification, growing more like Jesus Christ. And the key to walk in that same freedom, the key to doing that is, is called repentance, where we turn, where we're facing Egypt, we're facing our sin, and we turn. We say, that's not me. That's not what I want to pursue anymore. And we turn 180, and we go the other way. We pursue the cross. We do that every day. We come to the cross and we turn around, we recognize that that's not me, that's not where I want to pursue anymore. Sin is dead and I want to turn. And you'd be sitting there going, yeah, yeah, that, that seems real easy up there to just do that sweet little turn and go around. But man, the sin in my heart is not that easy. This whole repentance thing, it isn't that easy. And, and, and I get Egypt's dead. I get I don't need to live in the parking lot anymore. I can go into the Super Bowl and I can find true freedom, but, but it's not that easy. You know, some sin is simple. Some sin, it's easy to turn. It's easy to do the 180. It's, it's just walking, right? And you know, that's not the way to go. I got to turn. I got to pursue after the cross. But some sin's not that easy. Some sin, it's like you're running. It's like you've been running towards this sin. It's, it's not as easy to do the 180 when you're running. It takes a, a little longer to slow down. Some sin, some shame, some guilt. It's like you're on a bike. That takes even longer. Some, sin, some shame, some sin and guilt that you carry, it's like you're in a car, and it's going to take a lot longer to stop, to turn that car. Some, some sin, some guilt and shame that you're carrying right now, it's like a tanker ship. And you're right, it's not always going to be this instantaneous, easy thing to turn. It's going to take a life of sanctification of God revealing that sin as you slow this tanker ship down and begin to turn it. But, but you do that day after day, month after month, where you come and remember the gospel every day. It isn't instant all the time. But you've given your life to Christ, you have God's spirit in you. And you can even see those tanker sins begin to slow down and begin to come to a stop. As day by day you recognize that no longer, if you're in Christ, no longer is it you standing here, this big pile of sin, and Jesus over here. Now in Christ, it's you and Jesus standing together, facing your sin together. As every day you, you rely on the gospel, as every day you turn, but you need to come to the cross. You need to come to that place where you recognize that it is hopeless without Christ. That you're not going to be able to swim across the Red Sea. You know, fl flip back to John chapter 6 real quick. Just the last thing for tonight. Just the end of John 66, John 6 and verse 66. I mean, we have to realize that we are desperate for Christ. If you want freedom, you're not going to be swimming. You're not building a bridge, but you recognize your hopelessness. And I like what Peter says to Jesus in John 6. Look at verse 66. Jesus has been teaching these hard things. It says, and after many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him, they left. Like, I can't do this. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Look what Simon Peter says. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I love that. It's almost like Peter was actually thinking about it. It's almost like he had already gone through the thought process and already thought through, yeah, Jesus, you're not an easy guy to follow. 
You keep telling people they got to die if they want to follow you. That's not easy. Every time we stop and we have some good followers, what do you do? You tell them they got to eat your flesh and drink your blood. You're not helping us out a lot here, right? But he says, listen, I've looked everywhere else. I've tried all other things. I've tried other people, other situations, and they're hopeless. He admits it's a waste that he's helpless. He says, I can't go anywhere else. Why? Because you have the words of eternal life. I mean, what a great place to be. That's the beginning of new life. When when you come to the end of yourself and you you find out that your freedom isn't found in all these other things, but your freedom's found in the gospel, in the good news that Jesus died in your place, that he's come to rescue you from your greatest problem, to come to provide us with ultimate freedom. And Jesus comes as the Lamb of God, And he dies in our place so that on the far side of the cross, there's no more shame, no more guilt. On the far side of the Red Sea, the Egyptians are dead and gone. But it's when you stop looking to the cross, it's when you go back to the shores of the Red Sea and you look for Pharaoh and you drag him out of the Red Sea and you drag him along with you, you're no longer free. In fact, what you're saying is, Jesus, I get it, but your, your death, your sacrifice, it won't take care of this. You can't bring me freedom in this. It's not enough. But listen, put off the old self. The, get, the guilt, the shame, the death, throw it in the sea, let it drown. And sometimes you'll be tempted to drag it out, but in those times you need to believe, again, the truth of the gospel, that it's dead. It's not who you are. And Satan will come and he'll try to, he'll try to convince you that it is who you are, that, that you really are that, that old person. And he'll point to the, your history. He'll point to facts. He'll say, oh, but look, look at this sin. And he'll be right. He'll point to the truth of where that sin is or was. He'll point to the truth of your hurt, of, of all these things. And it happened. But listen, the reality of the gospel says it's changed. You've been made new. And this weekend, you're going to hear Robbie and Norm preach. And my guess is, man, they are going to touch in on sin in your heart. And and they're going to press in on it. And they're going to talk about sin. And when they do that, listen, you've got a choice. You can either hear that. You can feel that, that pain in your heart of sin being pressed in on, being revealed, being opened up. And you can either hear it as the voice of the evil one. And that moment, and, and in that moment as the evil one speaks, you can hear it as condemnation. And you can stay seated in that jail. You can stay seated hiding in shame. Or listen, you can hear those words as the words from Jesus Christ. When your heart aches as sin is pressed in on, you can recognize as the grace of God in your life. You can recognize it for what it is. It's sin. And hey, I've got an answer for that. There's hope for that. You can be set free. So let's make this weekend a little bit different. Let's not hide in our sin and shame. Let's not isolate ourselves. Let's not avoid worship. Let's not avoid the word. Let's not avoid being real with others. I mean, man, when you go to church, we get so good at that. We get so good at faking it. We get so good at putting on those masks that say, I'm okay. I'm okay. We're all okay. How are you doing? I'm okay. Everybody at Harvest is okay. We don't have problems. We're not messed up. We're, and we plant that mask so tightly on our face. And listen, it's so tiring, isn't it? It's so tiring faking being okay all the time. I think that's why Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary because sin and shame and faking it, these masks, it's so tiring. Let's bring it to the cross. Let's cast it into the sea. Let's recognize that we're free because Jesus says we're free. And tonight, if you're still living in a jail cell, and maybe you're actually sitting in a jail cell, and that cell door is locked because you've never placed your trust in Jesus Christ, and there's no hope for you to ever get out of that jail cell with that door locked. I mean, I pray that tonight you wouldn't leave it, that you wouldn't, well, I'll wait till tomorrow because maybe that's the home run sermon for me to make the choice. But know that right now, if you recognize that I've never made that choice, I've never come to Christ and fallen on my face, and I've never accepted the fact that I'm a sinner locked in this jail cell, and I believe that the blood of Christ can set me free and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. If you've never done that, then be set free tonight. Maybe you are a follower of Christ. You're still sitting in a jail cell. The door is open. You can leave, but you're sitting there. 
And tonight, what, what, what part of Egypt, what part of Pharaoh, what part of that life on the other side of the Red Sea do you need to throw back into the sea? I mean, do you need to leave behind resentment and bitterness and find forgiveness tonight? Do you need to leave behind entitlement and complaining and, and tonight find gratefulness? Do you need to leave behind a heart that's closed tight with no emotion allowed to come in or go out and you need to find an open heart to the gospel? Do you need to leave stubbornness and pride? Maybe tonight find surrender and brokenness and humility. Maybe tonight do you need to leave shame and find freedom. Do you need to, to leave faking it and drop the mask and grab a hold of grace? I mean, this isn't easy. I mean, for some of you, it's not a matter of I just drop it and I'm good. For, this is going to take a work of the Spirit in your life. It's going to take other brothers coming alongside to pray with you and to walk with you. For some of you, you've been sitting in this jail cell for a long time and it's to find who you are. Don't leave here alone. Don't hide. Don't, don't walk out of here even tonight without grabbing somebody and saying, hey, hey, would you walk through me with this? Would you pray for me? Grab somebody. Why? Because if you walk out of here alone, that, 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 that voice that, that calls you a, a sinner and shameful and, and, and places all that guilt in you, that same voice is telling you, keep it quiet. Don't tell anybody. Why? Why? Because Satan doesn't want you to hear the voice of truth voice is telling you the truth that you are free. That when you believe and you turn to the cross that there's new life. That when you get down on your knees before the cross that there's level ground there. That, the, that those who are proud are brought low. And those who are weighed down by guilt and shame are brought up to the freedom that they have on the cross. Jesus says, if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Would you stand with me as I pray?